Electricity can be a mysterious thing. It flows through the wires in our walls to power our lights, stoves, and appliances. But how does flicking a switch turn the lights on? How does pressing the power button make your computer start up? How does plugging your phone into the wall actually charge the battery? To understand all of these, we use electric circuits to predict how the energy will flow. In reality, electric circuits are just abstractions, models that we use to logically understand which direction the electrons will or should move when we apply a potential or a voltage to them. Today, we'll take a look at the concept powering all of the devices around you every day, electric circuits. The 21st century has seen an impressive amount of innovation in the different ways that we use electricity. Just about everywhere these days, we've found some sort of way to put this powerful force of nature to practical use. To make a circuit, you need two different kinds of elements, active elements and passive ones. Active elements are the circuit elements that actually deliver power to the circuit. Batteries, outlets, and other sources of electricity are the active circuit elements that provide energy for our everyday activities. Passive elements are the ones that consume the power that we provide to them. Lights, heaters, electronics, all of these are commonly referred to as loads because they all require a certain amount of energy to drive them. There are three general types of loads, resistive, capacitive, and inductive. We define the three of them based on an ideal example of an associated circuit element, a resistor, a capacitor, or an inductor. Now, what's the difference between these three? For now, to keep things simple, we'll just consider the direct current case. The voltage will not alternate, it will only have one polarity. This type of voltage is very common in day-to-day -day life. Batteries, like in your laptop or phone, provide a DC voltage. So what happens if we apply a direct voltage to one of these loads? Well, a resistive load behaves pretty predictably. The voltage will make a current flow through the resistor. The resistor doesn't really care which direction the current travels in. What about those other two types of loads? Both of them react a little differently. A capacitor will act as an open circuit to a stabilized DC voltage. Electricity won't really flow through this. The charge will just build up on each of the plates and stay there. An inductor, though, will carry a lot of electricity electricity with a direct voltage. Because most inductors are actually just made out of windings of wire, a DC voltage will just flow through the wire like normal. Generally, we can treat this as a short circuit for most analysis. Now, why would we bother with these two components if they're so boring? Well, with a different kind of voltage source, these circuit elements behave very differently. If you have an alternating current source, the voltage across the element will be constantly changing. This is where we get to see the effects of electromagnetism in action. Put to use in everyday circuits. The concept of an alternating current is something that I've had difficulty understanding for a long time. At a glance, it seems like this system is kind of counterintuitive. How does electric current alternate back and forth? How is this possible? If electricity flows in a current a little bit like water, then how is it possible that we can change the direction back and forth so rapidly? If it is like water, then wouldn't it take more energy to change the direction of the flow? Well, here's where we find that the analogy is a little imperfect. People thought that electricity was a type of fluid for a long time, something that could flow when a force was applied of some kind. The primary difference between pipes filled with steam or water and copper or brass conductors is the density. Think about it. A pipe is hollow and only channels a liquid or gas through it, but a wire is solid. The way that electrons actually pass the energy through conductors is by allowing electrons to flow through it but they don't actually move that fast. It's just because of the atomic structure of the metal that allows it to conduct electricity so well. The way that alternating current actually provides power to a connected load is by careful timing of the voltage and current waveforms. Now, for electricity to flow, it needs some sort of motivation. Another term for voltage is electromotive force. This is what actually makes the electrons want to move. But remember, energy can't come from nowhere. It has to come from somewhere, be exchanged from some other source to actually make the electrons move. Without any energy, they won't move at all. It's not as simple as moving regular objects because they have an electrical charge. They're not neutral as most objects are. Thanks to James Maxwell's equations for electromagnetism, we know that any moving charge will produce a magnetic field. This is the primary reason that inductors react 
differently under an alternating current rather than a direct one. The DC current will just treat the inductor like a regular wire, but when you change the voltage and make it oscillate with an alternating current, this creates a magnetic field inside of the winding, which actually has a substantial effect on the current flowing through the inductor. Capacitors react in a similar way that inductors do when subjected to an alternating voltage, but instead of producing a magnetic field, this produces an electric field. The electrons don't actually pass through the gap, but they can exchange energy by accumulating enough charge on each side of the plates. This is how a capacitor can allow for the passage of an electrical current through it, even though the electrons don't actually cross the gap. If they did, this would result in something called dielectric breakdown, which sounds like a really awesome song lyric, but when it actually happens, it's not really that awesome. All these components can be found in everyday life in a variety of different forms. Inductors are found in power transformers for power lines and battery chargers for your phone or laptop. Capacitors are found in power transmission as well, and also in electronics, mainly for the purpose of filtering to make systems more stable and more resistant to outside interference. But this is only a small portion of the different ways that all these components are used, and how circuit theory helps us understand how electricity flows all around us. A good example of this is perhaps a lightning strike. This is caused by a large amount of charge separation because of the high wind speed and low temperature of the upper atmosphere. This means that electrons can actually be bumped loose from the molecules that make up the clouds. It's kind of interesting actually that we use a similar mechanism in capacitors. The charge is separated and eventually if enough voltage builds up the dielectric breaks down similar to a lightning strike. It's pretty amazing that we figured out a way to harness something as powerful as lightning just in a more controllable form to do all sorts of things that would be impossible to think of for people living even just a few decades ago.